All right. Good, good, good. Okay. Well, uh, welcome to kind of our first small firms roundtable session. Thanks for joining us. Um, we have the pleasure uh, of the company of Donna Carter, FAIA. She is a principal here at Carter Design Associates. And we are um, going to talk a little bit about her career. And we are going to uh, touch on a project that she is involved with uh, at 1191 Navasota Street, which is uh, formerly the, um, uh, well, the original building was designed by John Chase and it was built for the Texas Colored uh, Teachers Association of Texas back in uh, the 1950s. And it has recently been purchased by the University of Texas and they will be um, uh, transforming it into a community engagement center under the direction of UT's um, Division of Diversity uh, and Equity and Community Engagement. And um, so uh, I would like to share my screen here for a second. I wanna give a shout out to our sponsors for this year's committee. They are Mend Services, Syntex Sash and Door, and Night Construction. And if there are any representatives from any of those um, sponsors, if you would like to take a moment to say something, please, please feel free to take the floor. I wasn't sure if anyone was joining us today, but. Okay, all right, I'm gonna take that as a no. But anyway, men's services, um, Syntex Ashendor and and night construction. So I encourage you to kind of Google them. You can, you can kind of see uh, what they're, what they're all about. And hopefully in the future, we'll, we'll have an opportunity for you to meet them in, in uh, you know, over zoom. So with, with, without further ado, I'd, I'd like to kind of formally introduce Donna here. If you want to maybe go back to your, your video there, Donna, so everybody okay. can say hi. All right. Oh, okay. Let's see. Do I stop sharing my screen to do that? Yep. Okay. I will do that. Cool. There you are. All right. Hi, everybody. I'm glad you're here. Um, and um, I hope I won't bore you too much and uh, have a very nice lunch. So, <laughs> no, I'm, I'm looking forward. Hopefully I won't talk too long so we can have um, discussion at the end because I'm sure there'll be questions and I'd like to hear from you because I'm sure you'll have a, a lot to, to teach me too. So this would be great. I do, I do want us to jump in here and just say, you know, this is pretty, pretty informal. So if you, you know, we have the chat feature if you want to, to type questions into the chat or you're welcome to just kind of speak up and and take the floor if you have a question for donna so very very informal um and i'm i'm so glad that donna's here with us i i have only uh just met donna myself virtually i just ha had read about this project uh with the john chase building and uh reached out to her and she was gracious enough to to take some time out of her busy schedule to just talk a little bit more about her work i think what i was uh, most drawn to, I think, and again, I'm 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 getting to know her myself, uh, and and excited for for today's presentation. But I think what 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 drew me to her was the fact that she is a proprietor of a small firm. Uh, I believe there's there's two 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 architects and and there's six total. Is that correct? That's Donna? right. We have three okay. architects now. Three architects. Okay, so mm -hmm. six six person office total, but they have been involved uh, in some very incredible civic projects, which as, you know, having a small firm myself, I think I've always ascribed civic projects to larger firms with, with, with more personnel to be able to kind of handle, handle that. And, and, and she seems to have been able to find uh, these really incredible opportunities in the civic realm, which um, I, I personally am, am kind of interested in, in how you get involved in those, how you might become a part of those. And so uh, one, one of my personal agenda items, I, I guess, today is to, to learn more about 
uh, how she creates those opportunities for herself and, and who, who, you know, just, you know, how, how that process works. So I think, um, we're going to start with, with Donna's going to kind of share her screen and, and give a small presentation, uh, that takes us back in her history, kind of explains the arc of her career, um, probably expresses her, her particular interests, uh, because I think, I think she has some very specific skill sets that she brings to, uh, the, the projects that she's involved with. And, and we'll just kind of, kind of take the conversation from there. So All Donna, right. if you're ready, go ahead and take are the Are you seeing the screen? Oh, there's the green we are. rectangle. All right. And I sort of include this first slide because the reality of it is um, I'm going to be looking at work from the 70s and the 80s all the way up to where we are now. And quite frankly, I'm approaching 70. So this is a, an arc of, um, of, of a career, but it'll give you a little bit of an insight. And some of you will probably have seen a lot of this. Um, just a little insight, kind of how I I got to where I am or why I think the way I do about certain things. And I'm very much a child of the late 60s, early 70s. My you know, visuals were formed by probably the first generation that sat and ate dinner in front of the news that was a war. So what we now look at is almost entertainment when we see battle scenes. I mean, those were very real. That was my, my brother's friends um, in Vietnam. And um, it was a daily onslaught um, from day to day. It was also Kent State um, student shootings. It was Jackson State, which is a um, HBCU, a historically black university, and <clears throat> um, that we didn't hear very much about. But again, this, this was just forming um, who and what I was um, as a teenager. And, you know, what, what was I going to do? Where was I? But I had been um, uh, brought up in a, in a, a, a family. Um, I'm actually second generation. Both of my parents were educated. My father was an attorney. My mother was an English teacher. And when I say English teacher, I mean, we sat down and she read, you know, Shakespeare. She read Tennyson to us. I mean, it was, um, uh, it was quote unquote, the queen's English, uh, but my father went to the March on Washington. So when I see where, you know, demonstrations today, when I see, um, you know, how that has evolved, it's still a very familiar place. I mean, that was what we talked about around the dinner table. That was what we drove and took my father to the bus of all the, the people and mostly men, quite frankly, but the men from our um, community loaded on the bus to go to the March on Washington. But that community was um, one that was um, really quite different. Um, I actually, for most of my life, grew up in a very tiny town in New England called Sudbury, and it was established in 1639, uh, um, before the Revolutionary War. And in, and as I said, and it was a suburb, and it was a suburb um, that was only about 20,000 people, and there were exactly, by the time we lived there, there were exactly five African-American families out of that 20,000 people. And so um, I, uh, Boston still had not desegregated its schools. We would see signs um, such as the one in this image. Um, but that is sort of the environment that, um, that, that I grew up in. Um, yet, if that's me down on the, the little kid with the curls. Um, it was a, quite honestly, a typical and almost um, because of the age of integration, because of those things, almost a typical leave it to beaver family, except for the fact that my mother worked, she did work as a teacher, um, and had all the aspirations, you are going to go to college, you will actually do better than we do. Um, this is what is expected. And in that process, I actually went to school in England. And even though the little town I had grown up in, 
um, was incorporated in 1639, and that seemed incredibly old, and that seemed to have an incredible history. Um, I suddenly found myself where walking literally um, it was an image like this, uh, walking through the fields, you would see ruins from, um, you know, the 900s. And many of those just in shambles because there was much better stuff down the road. And so that was where we, you know, kind of went and had picnics, um, you know, taking our books, um, you know, reading our fifth form, sixth form reading materials um, in order to pass the test because you had to pass the test in order to go to college. So that kind of informed, you know, what, what about, what do you want to do? How are you going to do? And the only thing I really knew is that when I was in Europe, everyone knew I was an American. When I was back home, I had the images of the shootings and the wars and people really and Black Panthers and trials. So I almost felt like I didn't have a home, didn't have a place that I could feel rooted, rooted. And in architecture, um, I sort of could do, I could kind of retreat into what I felt was an artistic world, um, but I also felt I could be of service. And you sort of fast forward from all of that and I end up in Austin, Texas. And, you know, so yes, how does a small, you know, architecture, you know, firm start to do these things? And the, the reality of it is I worked for a large firm. I worked on large projects, saw how they were managed, saw how um, they actually got broken up into many small pieces. And there were very distinct things that people were in charge of, people had to do. And I suddenly realized if I could start to do those very distinct things, that those would be um, those those would be skills that I could transfer um, as I went forward. For a variety of reasons, I wanted to work for myself. Um, I thought that would give me more time. I thought I'd be more in control of things. A lot of that, that's a whole nother lecture about how, especially for women, that doesn't work out that way. Uh, especially if you have little, and I'm sure all of you Zooming with the little kids in the background. Mine are, thank goodness, now in their 40s. Um, they don't come in with dirty diapers often. Um, but I realized I wanted to do something and I realized it was still rooted in um, that not having that foundation. So there was a lot of history. Um, and I was not, I was learning things at the large firm, but I was not working on projects that I felt very connected to. And so that all of that came together and that's when I decided to have my own firm. So, you know, how do you get projects? Well, it was public work. It was looking and drilling through the RFQs and what they might seem like big projects, but what are the skills that you have at that point that can translate? Because again, a, most, a lot of big projects break down. And so you're going to see this arc. This is something from the 80s. And the other thing about public work, and you think of civic work, it can be not for profits because they are a big part of what provides services that has direct connection to communities, direct connection to people, and really makes, a, makes differences in people's lives is that social service network. And so just becoming involved with, um, uh, with, with groups that were doing things that I thought needed to be done anyway. And suddenly you, again, had skills that they could use. And this was back in the 80s and people were thinking about how do we revitalize East Austin? And we just sort of cobbled together what if you look at what happens today is almost commonplace were pop-up venues. So we did a festival of pop-up venues um, made carts that people could use to, have, to, to literally take their wares to the big flea market out on Maynard Road. Um, we encouraged music. So we got um, several people from UT that, that, that 
uh, had been working and, and, and collecting some of the old blues. We got those performers out. And so we had our own festival in 1989. Um, before, but it was something that, um, again, uh, it, it was sort of vested. And so, you know, part of, part of why we do anything is it's because it hits you in a place that's meaningful. And when you do, and when, when you have that spot, you're just going to go all out for it. And that's what we did. Um, again, look for um, our, you know, RFQs, um, uh, especially with public work. This is, um, this turns out, turned out to be the first new building out at Bergstrom. And so it was a very stressful project because it was the project on the huge project management chart that came up red every morning. They could not open the airport until this facility, which happens to be the rescue facility. Um, they could not open the airport until the rescue facility was completed. So we were on the hot seat. But if you think about what is a rescue facility, well, it's a fire station. And what's a fire station? A fire station is actually a really big house that, that um, houses people that have to sleep and eat there 24 hours, just like a family. And they have some of the same issues that families have. And it's really, how do you build a nice house for them that, yeah, is rugged. It's also a house for um, a bunch of teenagers that don't take care of the walls, don't take care of the, um, you know, the, the, so it's, it's, it's a tough house. So if you think about, you know, kind of going after, um, again, looking at projects and describing them to yourselves um, in the terms and the skills that you know you already have. Uh, again, um, uh, so that was the first building at the airport. We did, um, along with, um, uh, really more as a design build and a developer driven, um, basically all of the original concessions on the West concourse of the airport. That was a little different strategy. That's literally what are they looking for and how can you pick absolutely the best um, partners to literally fill in everything they're looking for? in terms of answering that, that questionnaire. In this case, they wanted um, Austin to be represented. So with um, my partner and my joint venture who now actually works here in the office, Gerard Kenny, we thought about, okay, what are the kind of, you know, if you think about in 1998, 97, 98, what are the iconic Austin names and brands um, basically you had, um, Matt Sell Rancho, you had Amy's ice cream had just come on the scene, Schlotzky's. Um, so we said, let's work with the concessionaire to get those people to sign on. We, we were going to look at them as local and then we're going to use as many local products as we possibly can. And that was our pitch. I mean, we literally came in with pieces of, you know, pecan wood, pieces of mesquite that we literally collected from places and sanded down and said, these are the materials we're going to use. And this is going to be and speak Austin. And so, yes, a lot of extra work. We're showing them that we're, we're in it because it, it's a piece of us. Um, does this work today? There are a lot of reasons why a lot of aspects of it don't, but I think the foundation of it and that commitment to putting together things that, um, that, that truly answer what they're looking for and showing how you're going to connect to them as, um, uh, as the client um, and as the owner um, is really, you know, the key. Uh, we also partner and 
this this is interesting and and one of the things um, that truly has helped and is a big part of why we are here today has been um, hub and minority goals. We would not have been able to uh, essentially be introduced to um, firms that are doing um, projects with with probably they would not have looked at us had they not had that requirement. How does that mature and go on into the future? And you know the you know the the, the white male small firm is going to say, well, where does that put me? Um, I think what it really means in the long term is diversity matters, because especially in civic work, especially with not for profits, you generally have several players, several layers. Your users, what we would normally think of as our client, the, 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 the people we get most close to are really the users. And there's probably another layer, whether it's the management layer, whether it's the social service agency that's actually sponsoring something that's, that's in between. So having that diversity, whether you it's by ownership or by who you bring into your firm, that ability to have that connection with this community, I think is very important. But through that, we've also met other disciplines. And so we've been able to, to now work with landscape architects, again, as subs. We're, often we're subs. They're doing a much bigger part of the project. But there are small pieces of that. And then when I bring in the, the, the fact that I've always had that, that preservation um, bent, Therefore, working with existing buildings, um, this is one where we have a suggestion, how do you take basically an old um, metal farm building um, and um, what do you do to the, the, the structure, the bare bones, can you, can you um, soften it up? And in this case, it, it, because of budget, it won't be built probably um, for a while, but um, so we added some wood shutters to it. But, it, it was a, a, co a collaboration. And again, we're actually just working as subs to um, the landscape architect that has a, a much broader role in um, that. Uh, again, it, it's smaller pieces. This is one um, that, uh, again, is just it's the bus stop at at ABIA. It was totally um, separate from all of the other work, but at some point um, when the, we firmed up all of the transportation, um, we, we did that. A again, um, it's a, I, th I think the idea is always um, finding those pieces. Um, part of what um, I, I have focused on in my career has been the preservation aspect but because it's often been with communities that have been underserved, there's been an infrastructure that has to go with that. And so again, I've sort of taken that knowledge and that going towards that infrastructure and I spread out, whether it's again in, in bus stops, we've done some planning work, um, worked on the Great Streets um, uh, master plan, um, did several master plans in, in East Austin, worked on the community redevelopment plan. So, you know, just it, it all kind of feeds on itself and it allows, um, again, how you can um, go into the, um, uh, how you can then break it apart and do different and smaller pieces. And, and that is something that a, a small firm can very easily do learning about it and learning how to manage that is again another thing that if you can manage it well then there's a lot that you can do and and um, even then if you if we look at the carver where we actually were the prime we managed 14 other firms by the time you get all the exhibit designers and the theater designers and and very specialized um uh, consultants that you need on a, pro on a project that's a library, a, a cultural center, an archival center. 
as well as sitting in a park space, um, working with artists. Um, but if you learn those management skills, then um, again, that that's, that's is what they're going to look for. And, and that is very important. And it is different than working with um, smaller clients. So we've just sort of carried that through. This is a project that's just finished in Buda. Um, again, we're doing just some of the, the, the small building structures in a much larger park. This is an amphitheater um, that uh, then does bleed into the Great Lawn. Um, again, as a sub, a, a very small part of a much, much larger project when you think about buying large electric storage batteries, <clears throat> getting those put in place, keeping those cool, getting those grounded, doing all the electrics, we did a security fence. And so this was, um, this is out at Miller, um, small security fence around the batteries that that has to be secure, has to follow AE's rules, is <clears throat> really just a, it is a, a, a it, it is uh, for them utilitarian, but for the community, it's something that they have to walk by all the time. Um, another parks uh, with the aquatics, then again, what is an aquatics, you know, part of it is assembling the right team. Um, this is a situation, and I think, again, small firms are very much um, uh, capable of this. The city is going to, and, and the state uses um, construction managers at risk. The city goes, is using a lot of design build. So if you have relationships with contractors, that may be an end to some of these. And again, you look at a park project, if you know the consultants you're going to need to bring on board to, to fill out your team, and it may be a consortium of other small firms, and that can work very well, as well as your specialty water design consultants, specialty landscape, specialty, ar specialty arborists, or depending on, on what you need, the building pieces are, are quite small. You know, they're, they're restrooms, they're, they're picnic tables, they're um, uh, pavilions. So, you know, I, they, they really are not daunting. Um, in our utility, again, working with subs, this is a, a utility plant. Um, it also, this particular project where lots and lots of firms involved, very small, a relatively small piece, but an important piece has to be finished first. Um, we came on, really, we were just supposed to do the documents. And in some cases, that's okay. First of all, it teaches you about the building type. Um, you, you know, you, you learn how to work in that environment. If that works well, something else comes up, then maybe you are the lead designer. So it, it, it is part of how do you build your position in this world. But it was also a situation that a lot of moving pieces, this was the original concept for it. And I'm looking at it and saying, you know, I, there's a part of me that just, doesn't like smokestacks. I mean, I'm old enough that it brings back some really chilling images and feelings for me. And in the process of having to look at it for a new location, in that process, we actually um, made an impact on at least the, for me, what was the uh, original look of it. We can argue one way or another, you know, some people probably say, oh, it would have been nice to have the crenellation and, and, and I accept that. But I think my point is, even if you're in a big team and even if you are the smallest goldfish and are actually one, a cracker goldfish and therefore melting in that pond and being eaten up by everybody else, you can say things and you may indeed have an effect. And this is one that we're working on right now. This is um, going to be at Rainy Street. And um, this 
is um, again a security enclosure for a very large. It's you know one of the <clears throat> it'll be one of the power stations for downtown, and so this is a security fence as well as a building that will house uh, switchgear, and so um, you know our charge was and hopefully we have made an interesting one that will at least change as you walk around this very, very large fenced, it's a, it's a city block plus. As I said, I think civic partnerships are, 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 are social partnerships are just as important. So before we had the federally qualified clinics here in town and when uh, Seton and Ascension were <clears throat> one of the few um, community clinics. Um, we did work with them to get community clinics um, in three areas of town. And again, part of that was, you know, healthcare planning, realizing we needed clinics and kind of working with them and going to, to them to get that done. Um, neighborhood park, this just happens to be a park around my, you know, near my house neighborhood, you hear about it in your neighborhood group, they need some help. And we did this pro bono, said, yeah, we'll help you. You've got a small grant. We also worked with the supplier. Can you help this group out? Let's get this done as um, inexpensively as we possibly can. But really just, you know, you're, you're, you're working. And I extend that to, this is way out in East Texas, but it is a group that's, you know, trying to research their history. And so trying to, to bring something else to the table saying, you know, it, it, especially with African American history, it's not just the building, we need to do archaeology, you know, archaeology, and, and really introducing them to the archaeological side of it. Um, and so that's, that's been a re very rewarding to go to these um, small historical societies, um, small rural communities, the freedman communities, helping them research um, their backgrounds. And that's me. And evidently, when it PDF'd, it didn't come through, but that says Donna Carter on top. And if you need to get in touch with me, I'm terrible at social media and, so, and I get a lot of invites for LinkedIn and I'm terrible at it. It's not that I've snubbed you. Just send me an email at CDA at Carter Design and I'll be more than happy to talk to you. Thank you, Donna, for that. Um, that was incredible. What, what a, what a, what a, a broad array of, of, of project types and, and an interesting kind of collection of context around each, each one. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm just, um, I don't know. I, that, that, uh, we, we had talked on the phone about the, the enclosure, uh, the, the electrical enclosure on the rainy street mm -hmm. is that exceeded my expectations from our, <laughs> From our from the visual to 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 seeing the actual rendering of it, that's that's quite quite interesting and should be quite quite beautiful. Um, well, you you know you t you touched on a lot of different uh, a lot of different aspects. Um, kind of talked about the um, you know ways in which you can potentially go after these civic projects. Uh, the importance of of understanding the community that that you're working for, how to maybe engage other organizations that are, you know, actively engaged in those communities already so that you can, you know, potentially offer your services mm -hmm. uh, in order to get involved. So I feel like that was a very, um, there was a lot of specifics in there that we can take away into our own practices if we're interested in pursuing uh, projects, uh, you, know, you know, more community-based projects. So thank you for that. I did not expect such a polished presentation, so that was amazing. <laughs> um, so I do, I do want to maybe pivot to 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 the John Chase Building mm -hmm. uh, at eleven ninety one. You know, certainly um, his his kind of long overdue recognition in in the city of Austin for his architectural legacy uh, in this town has 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 become energized over the last couple of years. And um, and and just kind of coming from that from that standpoint, 
I would be interested to understand. I mean, from my, from my quick research into the building. Um, so, you know, basically he created that, that building for the Colored Teacher State Association of mm -hmm. Texas, which was established in 1884 to promote quality education for blacks and good working condi conditions for black teachers. Um, amidst Jim Crow laws, the association struggled to establish a state supported black college and continued without success until 1946 when Herman M. Sweat brought suit against the University of Texas to gain entrance into its law school. Um, Mr. Sweat was ultimately allowed access to the university in 1950, um, paving the way for other black students to be able to follow in his footsteps. And you know, you had mentioned something about kind of the irony of, of, of the new ownership of the building kind of circling back to maybe w one of the issues that, that created or, or was a catalyst for creating this organization in the first place because they, they didn't have access to UT uh, and had to, and, and had to, to fight to, to, to earn that entrance. Um, and so I, I would just be curious to know kind of a little bit about the history uh, of, of the building and, and kind of what, what, what its new life may be. And, and if you could speak a little bit about, I think this is, this is a good example of, of you plugging in to this project with a very particular skill set. And I believe if I remember from our conversation, something that you're very passionate about personally, uh, which I think I got from our conversation that, that that's also of great import to you, right? To, to kind of be able to lean on the interests that you have and apply those to, to particular projects. So if you wanna talk about this project in, in, in that lens and, and maybe mm -hmm. we'll learn a little bit more about its history as well. Right, do you, um, uh... I, I don't know if anybody, if you have a photo of it or people want to see yes, it. Yes, I will, I will share uh, um, my screen. This is kind of just the street, the street yeah, view um, right. there on Navasota. And um, so, yeah, so the, the other interesting thing about it, it was designed by, by John Chase and built um, 1951 to 52. And this was literally, um, uh, you know, he he was not he got registered right after that, but um, I mean, literally, you know, he hadn't been able to go to 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 UT, um, and you know, they he was the first who actually went to the architecture school. So, um, you know, he was getting registered right at at at, at the end of doing this building. Uh, he went on to do most um, many religious um, uh, buildings in Houston, as well as he did the David Chapel here in Austin. So, uh, and what has happened is UT has really kind of, um, it, you know, kind of adopted him now as this, you know, this son, we're, we're going to claim him, we're going to kind of embrace him and, and, and do all of these things. And in that process, they did purchase this building. They are re renamed it the John Chase building. As you heard, it will have um, this uh, Office of Community Engagement. But it's really uh, part of it is and part of the work of the community engagement is the fact that UT came in in the 80s and bought up an awful lot of East Austin under very dubious um, contracts and amounts of money uh, because they wanted to expand the campus. So there's, you know, this this is not a building or a relationship that will uh, that will not be fraught with some tension. There will be tension there. The, um, you know, the backstory, how I got involved it, I did have a, what's called an indefinite delivery, indefinite quantity. Um, they, UT calls it something else, but it's essentially an open-ended task force driven, project driven contract with the University of Texas. I had done, um, a few projects under that. And it was actually at 
the very tail end of that contract when they got this building and they contacted me um, for the sole reason, well, probably two reasons. One, because I'm African-American, two, but they knew um, from that, from the, pre from the contract, from my credentials, that um, historic preservation is one of my specialties. And it has been for my entire career um, back part of the story. I used to be on the Texas Historical Commission. I mean, I, I used to be on the um, Antiquities Board um, that reviewed, and also the National Review Board that reviews National Register nominations. So, you know, there there is a, um, I mean, I have a background in historic preservation. So in absolute inimitable UT style, <clears throat> they have no idea how much it would cost them to redo this building. Um, in a lot of ways, they um, had no idea what they had. And they were going to do it in-house because they really didn't have a budget for it. And so someone said, oh, it's going to cost $400,000 to redo this. And it's going, and, and, but, and also that'll take care of our administration and all of that. They will do the documents, but um, they reached out to me and said, will you be a consultant? Will you review our work? Make sure we don't do anything that will um, jeopardize its listing on the National Register. Um, we don't want to do that. <clears throat> and to the extent that we can restore it to um, what it was when it was initially constructed, that's what we would like to do. So I'm saying, yeah, that's that's fine. I, I, I can do that. Um, at first, I didn't know whether they were trying to marry me with another architect or, you know, which architect they were marrying me with. And, you know, that's happened too. You know, sometimes you end up in a shotgun wedding. Um, but in, in this case, um, they were going to do it in-house and they were very, um, you know, they, they, they had that budget. Now, my problem is historic preservation, small buildings, pretty much until you get, you know, maybe over 2,000 square feet. It doesn't matter whether it's 600 square feet or 2,000. Um, it's going to be more than 400,000 to redo it. There's just, there, there's, there are too many small spaces to work with. There's too much material that has to either be removed to really get to it. And by the time you do it, it's just, um, it, it just costs more. So that was my first comment to them. You're going to need more money. Um, that did not endear me to them. Um, they did find a little bit more money. Um, it has, but it has been a slow process going forward. But I have worked very much um, as if they were my staff to a certain degree and they would provide documents um, and I will, would review them. But I did start out with a historic assessment report where I did what research I could, again, given my budget, and um, then go through the building and tell them what were the distinctive features of the building that must be retained during the historic preservation of the building. And, and as we went through this process, I also then met with um, the community engagement um, representatives. And so I actually worked with the end users and about what they would want to see. It was very, it's, but it's very interesting. It's a very tiny building. And of course, now UT wants to put all of their, you know, IT stuff on top of it, all of their special locks and, and all of their security. And, and, and so, you know, really becoming the intermediary again, um, among 
the user, the owner of the building, what I think is appropriate for the building, and the people that are now executing these documents. Um, so the architecture, all of the IT data, um, MEP, I believe, were all done in-house, structural and civil were done by outside consultants. So it was a very interesting mix of, um, you know, kind of who, who, who got to say what. And so I found myself having to tell the UT architect, hey, you need to tamp down the civil a little bit because first of all, for handrails, he's just throwing in city of Austin standard details. No, we can't put that handrail there. Um, he's decided, oh, well, I'm gonna get a ramp in kind of no matter how. And I kind of lost this battle. Um, I said, no, we need to do it by landscape and not just carve in a, a ramp. And, you know, it's just, it, you know, that's been a constant push pull. And right now I'm on the, you know, I'm still pushing <laughs> on, on, on that one. So, um, so, so that, that's been a, an interesting dynamic. And it's also been an interesting dynamic where um, normally I'm on the receiving end of the, you know, 25 page Excel sheet with what needs to be corrected um, but me telling them, you know, you don't have enough detail on that roof to tell the guy what to do, or you don't have the right slope on that because you're now it's going to leak. Um, you know, I'm telling them <laughs> what to do. So it's, a, My goodness. you know, it's kind of a, a weird, um, um, I mean, and, and, and it's not, um, I think everyone's been professional and I've told them, you know, if I, you know, I, I realize I'm just, I'm historic but there's a point where you can't take off your architect hat. Sure. And so I look at this not as, um, you know, me telling you what to do. I look at this really the same way you'd look at as a, a third party peer review. And, and, and I'll take it, I, I will put it out in the same way that I receive it when people look at my documents, because we all, you know, skip something or say, oh, the guy has to know how to put a window in. Um, you know, and, and often, and, and that is an interesting thing with small practices. Um, you know, if you work a lot with one builder, you know how that builder does something. And so there's a lot of information you don't have to put in your drawings. Well, when you shift over to the civic or the not-for-profit side, um, some of that information has to go back into the drawings because those are where you have your disputes when you have a bid or when you have uh, a GMP. And so you have to be very clear in your own mind and understand that level of detail that has to go back in the documents. Um, so when I did an, an, the assessment report, um, which I, I literally, I went through system by system. This is what we'll want to save. And they were very receptive. And, and But I also knew that half of what I said could not under their system really be done. And, um, and, and there are some things like, you know, hardware, it was not going to be a house museum. So the hardware couldn't be saved. So now it's a question, do we keep it and try to incorporate that into a picture display or a rail system where we use the brass knob? I mean, it's nice, it's great brass for one thing, <laughs> um, but um, it can't be a doorknob anymore. Um, and, and the same, there, there's some other metal work that was in the building that we're trying to figure out if there are ways of, of reusing it. Would that normally be a historic way of treating those elements? No. Um, you know, my historic preservation, there are always parts of it that are kind of less rigid than my counterparts, because I think a lot of things are living and they evolve and there is art involved and, and things can, can, can morph and, and some of those morphs and some of those 
um, mutations are, are really lovely and, and that should be allowed. Um, and that's certainly what, that's what a living culture does. Um, and, and for me, and, you know, if you think about some of the pictures that, that, um, or some of the things that formed my life, as much as I'm steeped in trying to, you know, I'm ever looking for my roots, there are aspects of that that I never want to go back to. I don't want my granddaughter to see signs like I saw. I don't want my granddaughter to see January 6th, but she did. Yeah. Um, so, um, so for me, it's, it is still going, you know, how does this go forward? And, and it's been a lesson for me as a small practice because one of our issues with John Chase is he really did not plan for his legacy. So we can't find those drawings. We don't know what his details were for, we don't know what the original front windows were. We, you know, there's a sill there that looks, just does not look, doesn't look like the sills in the back, looks out of place. Um, but we don't know what the original one was. Um, and I'm just as guilty. I haven't, you know, I just get up in the morning and go to work and do my thing. Um, and as the first slide said, I'm pushing 70. So um, I better start thinking. I mean, I've got, I got a short runway out there. <laughs> And I don't know. You seem like you have a lot of years <laughs> left in you, Donna. I hope so. I hope so. So, um, I mean, I have kind of a question, I guess, about okay. your conversations with the, with the, the, the community engagement, um, you know, people of UT and whether or not they are, are kind of aware of, of maybe the conflict you know, that you spoke of earlier in terms of kind of this land grab from UT and oh, now we're going to kind of highlight, you know, highlight one of our alumni that, that you know, previously we, we didn't go out of our way to, uh, you know, to highlight as, as, as the first black architect to, to graduate from our school of architecture. What, what are their goals for, for the building or the programming of the building and, and how does that address the, the legacy of UT itself. Right. It, well, I, I think it's very much in the notion of we are going to go forward. We are going to try to show our intent and not explain our intent. So okay. I don't think you'll ever see a statement about, okay. um, about any of that. There will be a, there, there will be statements. There will be you know, this is what we're doing. This is, you know, how we want to open up the facility. And one of the issues is, quite honestly, it's still a very small piece of land. So when they say they want to have a place where the community and UT engage and, and have um, opportunities there, um, again, part of that is, well, how big can they really be? How can you add on to this facility in a way that doesn't negatively impact the neighborhood around it and i mean literally you know you've got one house that literally is five feet away and you know another you know that's not that you know much off. i mean you know setbacks are um only as good as the um original lot lines i guess um sure. and in east austin they they can be blurry so um so I think it's going to be much more of who is there, um, the kinds of conversations they have, the if the community needs a place to have conversations with UT, even negotiations with UT. I think those kinds of things will, you know, will happen. And so in that sense, it's it's um, I this this is. I think way too overused a term, but you know, a safe space to for these interactions, for these um, these things to occur. Now, as the years and and if you look at the um, 
uh, the department itself. I mean, they have very clear, you know, goals about what they're going to be, what they're going to be doing, and um, the, the the kinds of things they're going to be doing on on campus. But um, you know. I, th I think our relationships with these institutions, our relationships with our past are by, by, by necessity, um, if, if, if we're going to heal, um, they all have to evolve. They have to evolve for, and from both sides. And so the question is how, and, and, and so this will be a place for that evolution. Okay. I mean, uh, relationships is kind of a good segue to my, my next question, and we, it's not necessarily a question, but we talked about this a little bit, and I thought you had a very, a very poignant and, and applicable anecdote for, you know, how we, how we move forward. Um, you know, as we, we, we obviously know that our profession has, needs to do a lot of, a lot of work um, to, to kind of expand our ability to promote, you um, the tenets of diversity and equity and inclusion. And, and you mentioned kind of a notion of forming larger networks, expanding your individual circles. Uh, and and you, you said you, you kind of liken it to kindergarten when you just <laughs> made friends, right? Yeah. Uh, which I love that idea. Uh, and, and, you know, how do we, how do we, how do we be, how do we be kindergartners in our, in our professional lives uh, and, and just, go out there and, and, and make friends and, and expand the people that we, that we work with and that we associate with. Well, and I mean, I, I, I truly do believe that, um, that if we looked at it um, as kindergartners and, and part of that is allowing people to ask questions. Um, it's allowing people to be ignorant. If, they are ignorant about something, and 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 I, I ignorant is not a bad word in in my vocabulary, um, so that you can foster a natural conversation, and you know not a political conversation. This is, this is a natural conversation. Um, if any of you were at TSA and heard the design lecture where one architect basically said, you know, diversity is overrated. Um, and it kind of got glossed over. And, um, and I, I thought that that, to me, that's still a teaching moment. And even the fact that it got glossed over, um, to me, even being able to say that is coming from a place of great privilege. Because it really in, 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 his world, it really doesn't matter. But what, what I would say is diversity matters incredibly. And part of it is, as I said before, because I know that my first introduction from some of those large firms doing some of those large projects when I was doing a very tiny piece of it was because they had to fill in a box in order to even get to first base. They filled in that box. We did a good job. It really wasn't as painful as they thought it was going to be. And so we continued to, to work with those things. Those people have become my friends. Those people have become my colleagues. Well, as we go forward, that should not mean that, um, you know, you as a white male shouldn't have the opportunity to make friends. But I also think that means your staff should be more diverse, even in a small firm, or associate with more diverse for firms. Um, and, it's, and it's that interplay, and it's that getting to know, um, getting to know people. And I think the, the real the, the real step aside on a lot of this, you know, civic and working with social groups um, is, is really, quite frankly, and I think it is sometimes small, uh, hard for, for small firms, and it's, it's hard when you think about justice and equity. It's hard when you think about working with these, with a community, is it's a lot less about your own ego. 
and we all know that architects have egos. I mean, you know, let's let's face it. I mean, it's I think it it's the it's the twenty first color in the box of crayons that we got. <laughs> um, but how you deal with that ego in that this type of setting in being able to have discussions to meet someone as a friend and if you have a question about do i use this terminology do i use these words you know when i say you people i really i'm not trying to be offensive i just don't know what to call you um and and do it from a way of i want to get it right i just don't know um and if you say something offensive to me, um, I might say something about it, but I, 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 you know, I, I should give you a benefit of the doubt as well. You do it a second time, I might remind you, you do it a third time, well, you know, it may, it may not go so well. <laughs> but um, th there is a, there, th th we, we are all, in the end, we are all human. And we, and we really, we need to get back there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's sure. my goal for 2021 <laughs> is getting back to human. Um, right. Well, maybe we have good, good, good headwind here yeah. going into, going into it. Um, Donna, this has been amazing. Um, thank you so much. Uh, it's been insightful, encouraging, supportive, uh, and and really happy to learn more about you and your firm and 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 the work you do and look forward to seeing you know many 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 more great <laughs> great great projects at, at your young age of seventy. Um, I, I do want to take this opportunity to maybe open up the floor to anyone who might have a question for you, if that's okay with you. Mm -hmm. um, please, anyone that's 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 here, feel free to to just speak up. I, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Oh, I'll jump in. Um, well, first, I just want to say I don't. Um, you know, I was at UT when the the new airport was being built. So, um, I just remember thinking how exciting it was that that it did have an Austin feel inside. And that I mean, and it still is very much that way. Like the thread gills and the book people. I mean, it's still like you arrive back at the airport. And you're like, oh, I'm home. This is Austin. It's all kind of summed up right there. And so if that was your idea, that that just seems brilliant. It seems like what everybody does these days. Well, it, it wasn't it wasn't our idea, but it the, the city said we want this to feel like Austin and they we we want these things. Yeah. And then what we did, and if you look at it, when it first opened, if you looked at the difference between the West and the East Concourse. What we did, we just went right to the icons. Mm -hmm. We went yeah. to Matt Cell Rancho. We went to Amy's. We went to those, you know, folks. It wasn't going to be a franchise of somebody else. Yeah. And so we fed back the RFQ, but we did it on steroids. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great idea. Just brilliant. And it's still just very much that way now. I love it. Thank you. Uh, hi, Donna. This is Ruben. It's been a hi. while. Yeah. <laughs> um, I just wanted to share as not a question, just feedback. Uh, in 2020, I found myself, uh, uh, you know, I'm a bicycle commuter. I've been biking a lot and I've been biking a lot through East Austin and I've been trying to find places like um, like historic places. And there are a lot of uh, uh, commemorative plaques out, outside of buildings. But, you know, I'm pleased. I, I, I like the story and the, 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 the background on the Ch Chase building. I'm going to have to stop by there um, on my next ride. Um, Please do. Yeah, I, you know, it's. I know that I've been by there just mm -hmm. based on the address. I just never realized it because you kind of zip by things, and uh, I can't hit every street. But now I know where I'm going to go next. Right, and well, I, I will give you a little sneak preview. Um, I've been working on actually developing context for East Austin. Um, and kind of gathering the information. We've been mapping the where all of the site markers are. Um, we've been 
adding other sites that would go with those con you know like there's an education context so you can see the sites of the first um where houston college was where samuel i mean where tillotson college was also things like green book locations um how some of those owners were involved with houston tillotson as educators anyways so we're 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 trying to we're actually at some point would be able to map these out and um, really try to use it as a backbone for um, not only telling stories in East Austin, but highlighting and showcasing um, these to people and right. hopefully be part of any redevelopment that continues. So anyway, I'm glad, glad, you're, glad you're doing that. There, there's some resources that you can find online. They're, they're a little hard to find that there are self-guided tours where you can do some of this that are a little bit helpful that that I've used, but uh, yeah, I'd like if you if you can contribute to helping connect those dots, I think people if they want to do something similar to what I've been doing, um, it'd be great to have something like that as a resource. Okay, great. Cool. I, you'll keep me going. Great. <laughs> <laughs> any other any other questions for Donna or comments? I guess cool. I just, if, yeah. if I can ask yeah, one more, sorry. Sure. Um, um, as far as the, the building on Navasota, um, what is it like? What stands out to you? I love to go into to buildings and I'm sure it's been covered by layers, but what stands out to you as something exciting or interesting that you'd like to see? So the, the reality is the outside is, and that front elevation is the best thing about it oh. and um i mean and that is you know i mean there's there's you know and when you actually peel back the lay i mean we kind of look at each of the pieces how it's layered how it you know if this was done in 51 how it starts to get into the kind of airline um you know with the you know the the tapering um, images and the tapering pieces. And then um, the front entry they have carried so the stone actually goes into the interior and then there was an in, there was an interior planter. And um, let's see. So so those really are the um, kind of the 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 big ticket items. And again, I had to, the whole thing with the um, planters on the inside, um, really not a um, thing that UT wanted to keep. So um, I've had to fight for those, but I, they're, they're now being retained. So that's good. Um, the, but that really is, it, he put everything and they put everything that they had into that. Um, I'm trying to see if I have a picture of the inside here, right, right, quick, as it, as my grandma would say. Um, but that's where they put everything in that structure. Um, the and on the inside, it's a cinder block building, so it's very, very sturdy. Um, but it just had a, a very few offices. Um, and over the years, it had been changed into a beauty salon. It was the House of Elegance. So it was a great name. And the um, and so there was, you know, shampoo sinks everywhere so we've had to strip all of that away um and uh you know so and there's been water damage because of that but in a lot of ways it was little things there there was an original toilet and so um just the original lavatory and urinal um were just very distinctly shaped and so we're trying to figure out ways we're not going to be able to use the toilet stuff and, and the signage on the inside. So again, we've tried to, we're, we've collected those sort of items and are trying to figure out how we're going to bring those, you know, kind of back into um, being able to be used. But yeah, it was all, it was all on the outside. 
Well, I think uh, that's that's our time. Don, are you are you are you looking for a picture of? I, I was, but okay, and I don't I don't have a great picture of it. That's cool. Um, that's cool. No worries. Tend tend to um, hone right in on the detail. You 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 got to take this piece out and do that. But anyway, that's uh, that's good. We like we like details. Um, um, okay, somebody's well, got to have a hard question for me. <laughs> anyone hard question? No. Okay. Uh, they're all hangry. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. Well, well, thanks. Thanks again, Donna. Thank you everyone that joined us. Um, please sign up for our email list. It's kind of our, our only way to, to, to kind of connect with you directly. And, and we, we sent out a survey last week. Thank you to anyone that, that filled that out. We might send out, you know, those periodically just to kind of check in with uh, who is participating and and get feedback on, you know, not only the 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 events that we've held, but but what people are interested in in learning about moving forward, so that we can try to tailor uh, our content to things that really um, really help you guys out in your own small firms, uh, no matter what kind of position you hold in in your respective firms. I also want to give a shout out to an, an event that is being held next Friday over Zoom. It's um, it's 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 from UT, uh, their their kind of opportunity um, network. It's it's titled COVID nineteen structural inequality and the future of low income Latinx construction workers in Austin, which I, sounds very interesting. It's free. Um, you know, um, event through UT. So we, we, we will be sending out uh, that information so that you can RSVP and, and sign up for that as well. I think it's just an hour, an hour long. So um, I hope you all have a great rest of your Friday. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for the kind words. And I really enjoyed being here. And you know where to get me. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank Thanks, you. everybody. Take right. care. Bye.